Oh, good morning, good evening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you said it, I believe no, Andy, it. That was we too believe long. your word, Lord. We just thank you for the, the word of God. We thank you for worship. We thank you for praise. We thank you for music. And we thank you for the saints that are here in the room and those that are watching with us out there. Father, you said it. We believe it. We're grateful for it. We thank you that it's from your word because your word we esteem more than our necessary food. We seek first your kingdom. We thank you for the goodness and the favor and the grace of God in this place and for anyone watching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Todd broke a string right at the end of rehearsal, yeah, so we, we uh, had to we, we had to modify. He played a he played a guitar you, with a boo boo. So, thank you, Josh. What uh, side do you want to answer? Which you know you got to say, Todd missing a string is probably a better guitar player than ninety eight percent of the guitar players in churches. <laughs> so, thank you, Todd. And it was thank fun you, to have the saxophone. We miss when thank Brian you. doesn't play the saxophone, so that was fun. All right, welcome to church, everyone, again. Hallelujah. We've got our... There it goes. Whoops. What did you just drop? Oh. My microphone. <laughs> oh. All right, we're starting off a little rough here, but uh, we're going we're gonna <laughs> to pick, gonna pick up the pace will, here in a it second. It will improve. So. Grace. <laughs> That's what you do when things... Uh, just means the service is going to be really good. Amen. Hey, Brian, welcome. All right. So all the downtown is full tonight for the Timberwolves, and wow. we believe that downtown is full for church, too, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Father, thank you for the word tonight. We're just, uh, we appreciate and are grateful that we get to be people of your word. We esteem your word, and we desire your word, and we believe your word, and we're hungry for it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I have to say when I, so, you know, on Sundays, Pastor Steve never will tell me what he's going to minister on. <laughs> Rarely will he even give me a clue. Uh, I just have to wait and find out. It's like a cliffhanger every Sunday. Um, but on Wednesdays, I usually get to see the, the scriptures ahead of time in the afternoon. And um, when I saw the title of this one, that's one of my favorite, favorite scriptures. Oh, I good. say this all the time as a prayer. To God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to him. So I'm excited for tonight. Good. Go ahead and talk about it if you want to tell anybody about it. But it, it's from Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You want to just uh, expand on that at all? Sure. It's your, uh, I love it too. We all love this word. Um, David said it. It's just such a humble, excellent prayer that puts God at the center of your life. It encompasses everything because we know that what we think comes out our mouth. Even quiet people, what you think comes out of your mouth at some point. It's expressed in some way. And what we're speaking, we want to line up with God's word. If you want to be a Christian, right? The world doesn't care. They just say whatever pops into their head and whatever, but as a Christian and, and people that want to honor God in their life, then what we think about and what we say matters, and the Holy Spirit will help us if we invite him to help us. So to me, it's one of those scriptures that, boy, if you could remember just to say this or pray this before you get out of bed, it would probably keep you from saying a bunch of stuff that gets yourself into trouble. How many have ever said a bunch of stuff that just got you in trouble. I talk a lot, and I talk a lot at work, so I've said all sorts of stuff that's gotten me in trouble. And so this is a really, for the talkers out there, this is a good one as far as let the words of my mouth be pleasing. But then for those of you that are quiet, that stew on things, the meditations of your heart also have to be in a line. So it kind of covers, the, covers every personality. Yeah, and Proverbs covers a lot of spar sparing your words and staying out of trouble. But uh, so... As we discuss this idea, one of the idea, one of the greatest revelation, revelation is just when the, the idea light bulb goes on. And one idea is that God's power was not released by him pointing. God's power wasn't released by him touching. 
Yeah, of course, laying on of hands is a, is a New Testament and, and a Bible principle, but when God created the heaven and the earth, he spoke. And so the principle of truth and the faith that comes from a believer must be spoken. And if we, when a person gets a revelation that the power of God is released when we speak through words, and you think, well, words, we, we say millions of words in our lifetime. Well, God wants us to take that seriously and realize that his power, the power that he desires, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available in these mortal bodies. If we learned that and we believed it and we expressed it in words coming out of our mouth, because I wish, everybody wishes they could just point at something and there'd be power. We don't have that ability, but we do have the ability to aim our words. And so as we learn the principle of words in, from Scripture, we realize that uh, the psalmist here uh, is saying, let the things that I say, the things that come out of my mouth, and the things that I meditate on in my heart. Now, most Christians know that God can see our heart, He knows our heart, and He hears our thoughts. There are many Christians that, that don't believe that, that God can hear your thoughts. So maybe they're uh, they've decided they won't speak certain things, but in their heart they're still saying it. And we need to accept the truth right now for anyone that has never crossed this line that God knows the depths of my heart. He knows the, the words of my heart. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows the imag The Bible talks about the imaginations of the heart. So we think the imaginations come from the head and the heart, the, the thoughts and, and desires come from the heart. But when you put them together, God knows it all. And so we accept that truth, and therefore we want to control the words of our mouth, and we want to make sure that we're thinking things that are just pure, lovely, of good report, things that are praiseworthy, so that uh, when God examines us on a regular basis, uh, we're, we're full of good things and not bad things. Amen. Well, and that's a New Testament principle. So even the, the scripture here that we're going to look at comes from the Old Testament. It's a New Testament principle principle first of all we're to what renew our mind to the word of god and we're to cast down vain imaginations and what everything that would exalt itself against the knowledge of god well what does that mean and bring every thought captive, captive to oh, the obedience of christ anything that would be contrary to the word of god is trying to exalt itself over the word of god so we are charged as christians to control our thought life. And God has given us the power on the inside to do so. So God's not asking us to do something that's impossible. With him, what, all things are possible. Think on things that are lovely and of pure and a good report. So it's in the New Testament, too. It's actually in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. It's in the whole scripture. And, and we just have to come to terms with that. But then understand that there's some good things for those that will do those, that will put that into practice. You know, some people believe, well, that's really deep. I don't know if I want to be that deep. But uh, when you examine the, 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 the ideas of words and your mouth and your tongue and, and what you say from Proverbs, everybody, every Christian should enjoy Proverbs because it's easy to read. It's just one little quote at a time, bing, 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 bing. There's no long paragraphs or anything like that. But one of the consistent themes of, of wisdom that uh, Solomon is presenting is that we are to guard our mouth, our words, our tongue, our lips. We're to guard the, the thoughts and the imaginations of our heart because out of the, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart is where everything starts and it comes up out of your mouth. And now not only are you uh, wrong on the inside, then you're wrong in what you said. And it's a process that continues and, and people don't even realize it. And we want, we pray because when, I, I remember when someone said it to me, I thought, there's no way that's the case. But the scripture absolutely positively declares these truths, that we are accountable for what we say. Jesus said it. He said, every idle word that man shall speak, he shall give account of in the day of judgment. When are you going to find time, Lord, to judge every single word that is spoken by every single human being that ever lived? But in, in eternity, there's no time. And there's going to be people that, that step right over into eternity with God. And there are people that go to the great white throne. And at that great white throne, they're going to, get, they're going to come and give account for every idle word they spoke in this life. That's a, that's a head scratcher. 
but Jesus said that's the truth. And so we want to examine or we want to acknowledge is what, what I want. The, now, you the, can ask for forgiveness. Well, of course, of course, yes. Because yeah. we have to Otherwise, do it Otherwise, we'd all be canceled. Canceled is a good word. We'd all From be canceled. It, right? And some of us have more gray hair than others. So then you've got a lot more opportunity to have said a lot of idle words. Uh, but you asked for is forgiveness. Is that how you get gray hair, by, by saying idle words? I don't know, but... Uh, you know, when you ask God to forgive you and you, and you repent of those things, then, then those things are forgotten and those things are wiped clean. Uh, but we reap the consequences. That, that's really what you, people don't understand. You do reap the consequences of the things that you speak because what you're speaking, you're sowing. And whether you're using faith in a positive for God or you're using faith in the negative by speaking out negativity, you are reaping those things. You're reaping those things. And so that's why this message is so important. And I think, too, that's why the enemy tries to poo-poo it so much. Why would the enemy care if, if there was an actual truth and power in this? If God spoke the worlds into existence and we speak our faith, and can frame our worlds, the world around us, our life, with our words. Of course, the devil doesn't want us to do that. Absolutely, the enemy wants us to speak like the rest of the world to keep us bound up. So this is, this is super powerful, and when you get a hold of this truth, it'll, it changes you. It changes your life. This is next-level stuff. And, you know, the, the body of Christ, you know, if we just take an examination a lot of the body of Christ doesn't want to know. They don't want to be accountable. But when you want to uh, believe God, when you want to walk in faith, when you want something to change, maybe something needs to change in your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, your husband, your wife, your children. Uh, there are many, many Christians that are, are, are asking God for help. Well, this is next level stuff as to how to begin to move towards getting that help from God. God wants you to get control of what you're saying so that he can move into your life with the answers to your prayers. But if you are continually being a naysayer and you continue to disqualify all the blessings of God that are written in his word, then you're canceling. The word cancel again. You're canceling your own blessings by the words that you're speaking. And some people go, well, I don't care about God enough to go to that degree. Well, us in here, we do believe well, it. Well, then and stop praying for God to help you. That's a good point. Very good point. Because God is helping you by giving you the answer in his word. It's right here. Well, that's next level, too. I mean, we're, we're talking next, next level. We're not talking uh, pablum. We're not talking wah, wah. We're not talking baby Christianity here. We're talking about how, how to get answers to prayer, how to get power in your life, how to see God's power work in your life, how to see changes. Sometime, you know, you're going to face, everyone's going to face something that they can't change. Maybe your, your brain power, maybe your money, maybe your, your will, maybe your strength, maybe whatever it is, you think you can change the situation and the circumstances just through sheer willpower. But there comes a time when you hit that wall where you know, I can't do anything about this. This is when a person begins to seek God for his power. Now, it'd be best if we would just humble ourselves and go, yeah, I want to do it this way. And if that's what the word says to do, that's what I want to do. And God spoke the world into existence. And so he said the words that we speak, his words are perfectly powerful. They always happen. Uh, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will accomplish that which I please and it will prosper in the thing where to I sent it. So God's word always works. It's for us to gain the faith to operate in the things that have already been said in the word by God. So what we do is we find a promise in the Bible that covers the situation we're in, and the Bible covers every situation you could ever face in this life. God knew from eternity past everything that any person would ever face in this life, and he put an answer to that in the Bible. So what your job is then is to find a, a promise from the Bible that covers it, and you begin to put that promise into your heart, and you begin to change the things you're saying instead of saying that it won't work, it doesn't work, I can't do it, it failed, all that. No, you say, yes, it can work, and then 
then you begin to speak the answer and you find the word. Now what's happening is you're doing it God's way and the power is in the word. I want to amplify this point. God deposited his power in his word. If you go to the top of a mountain to reach your hands up to try and touch God with your problem, he's going to turn you around, send you back down the hill and say the power to, to accomplish, to prosper, to be healed, to be delivered, to be set free, to be victorious, all those things, the power is in the word. So what does he send you back to do? Find a scripture to stand on and stay with it until that changes your life. Now, many of, of, of us, we, we pursue these things and we go, I don't know. But there are others of us that have st stuck to it doggedly. We pursued the truth. And by doing it, we've received answers from God. We've received blessings from God. We've received healing from God. We've received victory from God. We've received deliverance. Deliverance is one of the first thing a Christian should pursue as they come into the kingdom of God. If you've been a Christian 20 years and you're, you're bound by the devil, you should seek deliverance, and deliverance is in the world, Je in the word. Jesus isn't here today to come up to you and say, son, I cast that out of you. He gave us his word to believe that God delivers us from those bondages and we stand on his word. That's why it is written. And so we talk about it all the time. Go ahead, Pastor Nance, if you have something, otherwise we'll continue with our sheet. All right, so King David uh, wanted what he said and thought about uh, to pass the honorable test with God? That's a good question. David wanted the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be honorable, acceptable, pleasing to God. He wanted to change what he was saying. Maybe he was, David was a warrior, and maybe some of the things needed to change. Maybe something in your life needs to change about what you're speaking about your boss or about your job or about your family or about your life or about your circumstances. Maybe those things need to change. What David wanted was that the things that he said and the things that he thought would be honorable, they would pass the honor test with God. So if I step away tonight and I begin to meditate or think about my life, I want to stay in that place of saying and thinking things that are honorable to God and not drift off into carnality or worldliness or all that thing. So you can't continue to go back and forth in this and, and expect to be successful at, at ha receiving deliverance or victory or health or healing or prosperity or whatever it is that you need from God. And these are things that people need from God, and there's a way to do it. And this is a way to do it, and it works. Millions upon millions of Christians have succeeded in life through success in the Word, and this is how they did it. I just think we're living in a society that is so quick. Everybody wants a quick fix and a quick answer. And this is actually a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of learning to control your thoughts and learning to put God first and meditating on the things that are positive. And when you do that on a consistent basis, then when the storm comes up in your life, you're not blown off. You're not blown over. You might be a little wet. You might have your hairdo messed up a little bit, but you're still standing. You've come through the storm. You come through the storm on the other side. And then you just keep going forward. And things start to turn around in your life. And so this is Christianity that is all about being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. If you want to be a disciple, then you should want to reflect and represent Jesus, right? This is how, this is the pattern. And it's just an everyday process. You're not going to change overnight. You're, you're saved instantly when you accept Jesus into your heart. Old things pass away. Your spirit is sealed. All things are new. But then there's a whole lot of outworking of your Christianity 
to reflect the change that happened in your heart, to get that to actually be reflected reflected in your life. And it's an amazing journey, and it's a fun journey, and it does require some effort. It just does. There is not one thing in life that doesn't, that worthwhile, worth having, that doesn't come through some effort. Everything requires effort. It requires effort just to get up in the morning, to do anything. You have to put forth effort. So why should our faith be any different? This is, uh, this is an amazing thought here. Think about this. If, you're, if you had on your, on your forehead had a screen and everything you thought about played on the screen so somebody could look at you and know what's going on on the inside of you, well, God knows what's going on in your heart. So it is playing on the screen. God knows what's in the depth of your heart. And the day that we accept that, someone I just sensed in here, somebody doesn't believe it, but God knows hey, all look, the thoughts of the heart. If you can have a conversation with someone and then you open up your phone and every source of social media you has all of a sudden has advertising for what you just got done talking <laughs> about. Let's not go there, please. If, um, if, uh, oh, man. If this has that, how much bigger is God Jeepers. than this? Amazing. Anyway. All right, so the thoughts we think and allow to play in our minds as well as the words we speak are being recorded. Everyone say recorded. Recorded. For how long? <laughs> well, hey, what is, is it, how, much, how much capacity does the cloud have? Unlimited, oh, I right? I think it's unlimited. Okay, so if we on this earth can tap into unlimited data storage, then God has the ability to record every single word and thought that's ever played, come out of your mouth or played in your mind. You know, that doesn't it's, seem like such a far stretch anymore. Not anymore, When you it? understand just wow. basic technology, and I'm like not technology savvy at all, but I, I even understand some basic technology and some of the advances that they've made. And so the things that, if you read that scripture and thought about that 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, they didn't have it any kind of capacity to really understand that that is literal, that God could literally record everything. You know, I would imagine a lot of people put things in context to their frame of reference, right? They probably just thought, well, that's just kind of figuratively speaking or just kind of an idea. But I wonder how many Christians 40 years, 100 years ago, when there was no technology really, if they even thought that something like that would l literally be possible, and it is literally possible now, and there's a lot of smart people That's that know it's possible. So. so scripture tells us God is listening to our thoughts and to the meditations of our heart. So I'm going to skip the, the, the definition there. In Malachi, listen to this. Now, this Old Testament, I used Old Testament references because it presents the idea. Okay, someone says, well, I don't read the Old Testament. But the point is, is it gives you ideas that these, this is the truth of God's word. And so Malachi 3, 16 through 18 says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So we know that even if you're speaking what you want God to hear, or you're speaking what you don't want God to hear, He hears it anyway. And He also knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And so, so, the book of, so a book of remembrance was written before, this is Malachi 3, 16, uh, right in the same chapter as tithing, as a matter of fact. It says, so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They, verse 17 says, they shall be mine, says the Lord of, of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Verse 18, then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve God. So it's just a reminder from the, the, the last couple chapters of Malachi in the, in, in the Old Testament that God is listening and God is recording and God knows everything we say, everything we think. And so it's a good reminder for us to realize that, hey, I'm not hiding things from, I can't hide anything from God. So going on, one of the secrets of favor with God is meditation and memorization 
of the Word of God. Now we're going back to what David said about the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. But favor with God comes from meditation and memorization of God's Word. You will go in a positive direction. No matter what happens in life, you will go in a positive direction if you begin to meditate and memorize God's Word. It will change your life for the positive. The goal of, the pra- of, of this practice is to develop a sensitive spirit to the voice of God so that we hear His direction. This is another aspect of fellowship. It's having a real relationship with the Father. So, You know, if you look at that verse in Psalm, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. If you need strength, what are the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart? Are you honoring God in those areas? Because... Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You're redeemed from the curse of the law and the aspects of it. So, so it, it ties all of these ideas together when you just put some emphasis on what you're speaking and what you're meditating on. How many wouldn't love to have more strength in your life? I do. God is my redeemer. So, anyway. You know, someone, I just heard this thought. Someone's thinking, uh, you're just picking scriptures out of the Bible and making them your own. Exactly. I'm finding wor- the word. Now, once I learn to find the good stuff, right, mixed in with the good stuff is the stuff you also have to know from God. So you're not, we're not getting by, but what we're doing is we're finding what we want from the scripture, things to seek God for us, things to pray about, things to believe in faith for. These are goals that God has provided for us. There's a whole book of goals for us to... Well, and they're not taken out of context. And they are scriptures that are principles. So we are taking scriptures that emphasize the principle that we're talking about. But we're not creating a doctrine off of one scripture. All of these scriptures, there are multiple scriptures that say the same thing. And so if you're concerned about anyone picking a scripture out, well, is it in context? Is it a principle in God's word that he wants us to grasp hold of? Is it a doctrinal principle that can be found throughout scripture? And if the answer is yes, then it behooves us. God is telling us what he expects from us and the pattern that we are to live our life after. God told Joshua the process of success. Remember Moses had passed away. Joshua is now leading the children of Israel. And in Joshua it says, this book of the law or the Bible, let's just say the Bible shall not depart out of your mouth. So, so wisdom is, God's wisdom is telling Joshua, hey, to the best of your ability, get this stuff into your life, into your heart, into your mind, into your mouth, out, coming out of your mouth. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth or let's say will not stop coming out of your mouth. This should not stop coming out of your mouth. If we're going to speak, let's make sure that we're including Scripture coming out of our mouth. A Christian who never speaks the word is not in agreement with the word because in order to officially be in agreement, officially is just, in order to be officially in agreement with God's word, you need to speak that word out of your own mouth. You need to speak your agreement with God. Otherwise, the enemy just comes along and he throws a, 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 a contradictory thought to you and he'll just steal it away from you. But when we begin to speak it, this book of the law will not stop coming out of your mouth, but you'll meditate on it day and night that you may observe or see how to uh, to do according to all that is written therein. Then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So God had to show Joshua what to do in order to be the leader 
to take the children of Israel into the promised land. So we're using that as an example of what God told him how to find success in life. Now we're taking these principles that God gave Joshua and using them to find success in life. So we want to make sure we're speaking in line with God's word, that we're not contradicting God. And uh, that, that, that in itself is a major challenge in the things that we're talking about tonight. All right, so meditation on God's word builds... I, I, I said this. I mean, this is not the word of God. This is just Steve saying this. Meditation on God's word builds an impenetrable, impenetrable stronghold in our heart that keeps us on the right path. So when I meditate on God's word, it's building a stronghold in my heart. And this helps us walk in the spirit to ward off the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's one, that, that should be a goal of every Christian, to ward off the world, the flesh, and the devil. And by building a stronghold in our heart by the word of God, it wards off the world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen. You have anything? All right, so when the book of the law, any part of the Bible... When we say the book of the law, the Old Testament way of saying it is the book of the law, but for us in the New Testament, we just say any part of the Bible. When it gets into our spirit by memorization, the results are always positive, good, blessed, and favorable for our life. It's going to change our life for the better. So I'm never, it may seem monotonous, but your life is changing for the better. And that's our goal as Christians for our life to change for the better. Amen. Somebody say amen. 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 The All word right. of God is what? Living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is a sword. It's the sword of the spirit. Swords can cut weeds out of your life. Swords can stop the enemy from attacking you, from that attack being successful. Swords are very powerful weapons, the weapons of our warfare. Obviously, we needed them, or God wouldn't have given them to us. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in him through the pull, for the pulling down of strongholds. Well, you activate the weapon, the word of God, by speaking. So speaking it is... The mo that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you don't speak the word of God, it's hard to get that word deep down in your heart. Because by speaking it, you're hearing it, hearing it, and hearing it. And it's changing things. If you think about something that has to be cut down, you have a, a bush or something that's just been let go out in your front yard, and that thing needs some serious attention just a little snip here and there is not going to do it you got to go after that thing but if you stay at it and you have the proper tools you'll be able to get rid of it you'll be able to prune it you'll be able to get it to look great so there are things in all of our lives that should be better can be better jesus paid the price for them to be better there's nothing wrong with wanting your life to turn around and be blessed because Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for the consequences of our sin so that we wouldn't have to. So we wouldn't have to. And there is healing and there is freedom and there is deliverance. And this is one of the ways that you walk in those things. Many, many people won't believe it because they have guilt and shame. And you know what? This will drive yeah. guilt and shame out of your life. It will. You'll begin, to, you'll begin to see yourself as the righteousness of God in Christ. Why? Because you say it. How do I get rid of the unrighteous feeling of unworthiness by calling myself the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, saying the things that the word says about you? God so we're, loved me. God so loved me. You got to put yourself in the scriptures. Focus on how much God loves you. Find those scriptures about the love of God and speak them out over yourself. Words carry our faith and faith is where the power of God is when we release it by speaking it. Let's use an example. When Jesus told the centurion that he would come to his house and heal his servant, the centurion told Jesus this. He said, speak the word only. Think about that. Maybe you traveled to St. Paul to see a specialist or you went to another state to see a specialist. But this guy came to Jesus 
And he said, my servant is lying at the point of death. And Jesus said, I'll come to your house. I'll vary off the path of where I was going, and I'm going to come over to your house, and I'm going to heal him. And he said, I'm not worthy to have you, Jesus, in my home. So if you would just speak the word only, my servant would be healed. Why? Because I know I'm a man under authority. And when my, my superiors tell me to do something, I do it because that's the way authority works. Jesus, I recognize that you have spiritual authority over everything, and therefore, if you speak the word from right where we're standing, that word will go all the way home to my house, and it will heal my servant. And guess what Jesus said about it? He marveled at his faith. There was no laying on of hands, there were no prayer groups, and there was no special treatment for this guy. Matthew 8.10, here it is in the back page. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, he looked around at everybody, he said, truly I say to you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So the great faith was that this centurion believed the word that Jesus spoke carried the power to change circumstance with no distance. Right. All he did was speak the word out, and that word covered the distance it needed to get to his, his servant, and it drove out the sickness of what was going on with the centurion. And that, my friends, in a nutshell, is what we're presenting tonight, is that faith in God's word. This centurion is a beautiful example of believing God's word. Jesus' word was enough. He could have said, come lay your hands on him. He could have said, uh, come and, uh, you know, the, the woman with the issue of blood went to Jesus and she says, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, if I can make contact physically with Jesus, I'll be healed. It worked for her, but it was all through faith. And in this case, the centurion released his faith. Just say it and it's done and it happened. And Christians, this is such an exciting, it's exciting for me when I think of these things because this is how faith in the Bible works. And we want our people to get answers to prayer. We want people to have change. We want people to be healed. We want people to be delivered. We want people to be set free. We want people to prosper. One of the worst things for me is to know of people that are suffering and going through lack and insufficiency and trying to make their uh, ends meet when, when, the, when the Bible promises that God will help you to come out of poverty. God will help you to come out of lack and insufficiency. That God will supply your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It hurts my heart that people don't know that they can come out of these things. But you're going to have to be a doer of the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Going on? All right. Uh, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said, Verily, I haven't found faith so great. No, not anywhere in Israel. So speaking faith words in English and speaking spiritual words in other tongues by faith, in faith, bring the promises into manifestations. We want to add the prayer because in 14 of Corinthians, uh, when I speak in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So I know I'm praying perfectly when I do that. Sometimes I don't know what to pray for as I should. But when I pray in the spirit, when I pray in other tongues, I am able to tap into the perfect wisdom of God. And I trust that, I believe that, and I pray that you would believe that too, that you can tap into a perfect prayer when you pray in the spirit amen all right first corinthians 2 13 says these things which also we speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches but which the holy spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual so in a nutshell there it's the holy spirit teaches a language and it's the language of the spirit and you have the option you have the right you have the privilege to receive your prayer language so that when you don't know what to pray for as we ought you can pray in the Spirit. Everyone say pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. We believe in praying in the Spirit. That wasn't very enthusiastic, but nevertheless, I am enthusiastic. I, I, thank you, Randy. I get the privilege and the, I get the privilege and the honor to pray in the Spirit. All right, so going back to meditating on God's Word and speaking our faith is still being heard by God. Even though that was an Old Testament scripture we, we used, 
throughout the New Testament, Jesus says God hears us. And so he hears us when we pray, and he hears us when we use faith. Praise God. All right, Proverbs 15, 4 is an interesting scripture. It says, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Now, I just looked this up as before we started. A wholesome tongue has healing, has the cure, it has soundness, it has health, and it has the remedy. So a, 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 a wholesome tongue has all those things, healing, cure, soundness, health, and remedy. And he says, but uh, a, a, a perverse tongue, a breach, it breaks it down, it fractures, it crushes, it crashes, it ruins, and it shatters. So if you want to destroy things in your life, then curse it, speak the wrong thing, declare that it's bad, when in reality God wants you to say the blessings are good. Instead, people are saying the wrong things. And so a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach of spirit. You know, this isn't just for your own life either. Yeah, but you've got to have Mature, it for your own life in order well, to help others. Of course, but if it's all about you, then you're missing the point of your faith in Christianity because it's not all about you. It's about being a blessing to everybody else. But if your life is a wreck, it's pretty hard to help anybody else. So these principles you put into practice to get your own life going in the right direction so that then you can become a blessing to those around you. Then we begin to listen to other people, and you go, hey, those people know this stuff. And then you go, those people don't know this stuff. But we like to focus on those people know this stuff, and they're saying the same things we are because they're being doers of the word, not hearers only. Amen. All right, so then Proverbs goes on in 423. Keep your heart or guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The New Living Translation says guard. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. And we started off by saying, God hears the thoughts of your heart. And so what we're doing is we're guarding our heart to keep it from getting off into things that shouldn't be in our heart. Right. Jesus said, out of the heart proceed all these, you know, Jesus listed off all these things that are in the heart. But when you begin to put the word of God in, it begins the washing of water by the word. It begins to rinse out all those things out of your heart. Somebody in the room, somebody watching right now, you're going, how do I get the junk out of my heart? Be a doer of the word, put the word in. The washing of water by the word will rinse out all the stuff. The fuller soap of God's word will, will soap and scrub the stuff out of your life. And pretty soon you'll begin to swing towards having a pure heart, uh, a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, the psalmist said. Create in me a pure heart. How do I get to that place if I'm full of weird thoughts and, and all that junk that has accumulated all my life? You can change it. God gives you the power in his word to change it. And these are principles that will change what's in your heart because it's critical for us Christians in this day and age to not live a double life where we've got this, this really horrid stuff freely playing on the inside of our heart and mind when God knows exactly what's going on in your heart and mind. So what do we do? The cleansing, the washing of water by the word will cleanse out our heart and pretty soon... Well, Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, and we'll be able to look God in the eyes. We'll be able to stand before him. We'll have faith. We'll have, we'll have strength and courage. And I believe that with all of my heart. Amen. All right, so we're wrapping this up, unless Pastor Nancy had a comment. All right, so Psalm 1-2 says, His delight, the person, uh, blessed is the person who walks not in the, in the path of the ungodly, and then it goes on. But in verse 2 of Psalm 1-2, uh, it says, His delight is in the Word of God, or the law of the Lord. And in the Word of God does he meditate day and night. So uh, I don't know anybody that meditates day and night, but the, per the idea here is that 24 hours a day, you can talk and think about God's Word. Amen. All right, Psalm, thank you. Thank you very much. Psalm 91-2, I will say of the Lord, Psalm 91, wow, we need Psalm 91 every single day. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, Him will trust. I am saying that out loud. I'm building it into my heart, and I'm speaking it by faith. So Psalm 1, going back here, and instead of staring, I, I wrote a note here, instead of staring at your phone all day, 
just to look at nothing, reading news and what happened on the Oscars or whatever the, the award show was. Hopefully, no one, I, I didn't, I don't know anything about it. I just knew on my football show that, that there were stuff going on. But the point here is that we want to put the Word of God in our heart and our life. And so this is the blessing that comes with it. Psalm 1, Blessed is the person that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but their delight has changed into the law of the Lord, and in the Word of God, the law of the Lord, does he meditate day and night. That person's going to be like a tree that is planted by rivers of water. They will bring forth their fruit in their season. Their leaf will not wither, and whatsoever they do will prosper. That's a beautiful life for someone who will believe it. And so we take by faith these promises, and we take these scriptures, and we put them in our heart. We stand on them, we believe them, and we we expect and, and, and believe them to come to pass in our life. Do you have anything before we... Yeah, if you look at verse 1, blessed is the person that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's a problem for a lot of Christians if they are continually listening to people that don't know God and allowing them to That's speak great. direction Absolutely. into their life. That's the counsel of the ungodly. We want to be around godly wisdom and that's part of even being a, in a church that's preaching from the word of God you're going to pick up godly wisdom when you're listening to the word of God and you're around other Christians that are going in the same direction you don't want to walk around and your co-workers or your family members or no matter how good they may be as a person if they don't know God they don't love God and they don't care about moving forward with God that is not someone that you want to allow to speak direction into your life and then sure don't stand around where sinners are hanging out that to me says you're just putting yourself where you are going places that you should not be that are not good it's not going to produce good fruit for you to be there. So knock it off. And then don't sit down with people that are mocking God and scorning God. Limit. You know, that might be a close family member or something, but you can limit or cut that voice out of your life. For the most part, you can probably cut it out. Or you can significantly limit people mocking. I've even stopped people people that I work with or whatever, I don't, I don't bring my pastor self necessarily to my job, but there's been a few times where someone talking around me has crossed the line and I'll just nicely, nicely, did you hear me? Nicely correct that. I am not going to allow someone to mock or scorn God to my face or whatever she's bold and courageous she'll do it no doubt and they've stopped every single one of them i've never and and they've caught their they've caught themselves but if you don't have a relationship with god or you know out of the abundance of your heart people will speak but there's a lot of christians that are for lack of a better term out playing with fire you think somehow that you can hang around with a bunch of sinners or a bunch of ungodly people or put yourself in positions and your faith is strong enough or whatever and you I'm telling you that's deception 101 because that's not what the Bible says at all at all we want to be strong in our faith so that when we are put in positions we can make a difference for the kingdom of God but I don't I don't put myself in position for any of these three things to happen. So it's just, right. it's just wise counsel. Absolutely. If you want your life to be better tomorrow than it is today, then you got to do something different tomorrow than you did today. That's just. All right, wrapping this up, the Apostle Paul warned Pastor Timothy, or Timothy, just anybody, in the context of avoiding deception, lies, and the things that cause people to walk away from their faith, 
to stay nourished in the words of faith and good doctrine, the word of God. And so he told Timothy, meditate on these things. So we talked all night about meditating and uh, making sure that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart are acceptable in God's sight, our strength and our redeemer. And so um, this is... This is very basic Christianity for everybody in the room today that at some parts of this, you need to start. you got to start somewhere. Or step up further. Amen. All right, so we're closing now. And uh, we, sell this, we say the salvation prayer, and then we also uh, just say something about the offering. But I just want to remind everybody so I don't forget, we have Rev class on, Revelation class on Saturday. Last Last class, I think we had the biggest group we've had in years, and that was cool. And so you're invited to come to Revelation class Saturday morning at 9. And now we'll say the salvation prayer together, and then we'll just uh, receive the evening offering, and then we'll be dismissed. So uh, let's say, the, let's say the, uh, the salvation prayer. Dear God in heaven, Dear God in heaven I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for me. And was raised again from the dead. So that I could have eternal life. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. And be my Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I receive your forgiveness now. And I receive eternal life. And I thank and praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so Scripture tells all of us as Christians to share our resources with the church. And I'm not going to belabor the point. It gets beat up, but we're going to continue to say you can be blessed when you share your resources with the church. That's preaching the Word. And you can't tell me this is not preaching the Word. So share your resources with churches that are preaching God's Word because there's too many of them that have stopped preaching God's Word and we want to support the ones that are preaching God's Word. So, Father, we thank you for the tithes, the gifts, and the offerings that come into this church. Thank you for the people that are, are so loyally faithful to supporting this work, Father, downtown Minneapolis. Father, we thank you for the brothers and sisters that are watching online. We thank you for the brothers and sisters that are in the church. We thank you for the resources that come in. We promise to use them for your work and your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great night, and we will see you on Sunday.